All right, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Maria, it's all yours. Thank you. I would just like to announce that that uh, we will be continuing our monthly meetings. And after this, after our speaker, Charlotte, we will be having um, a virtual meet and greet for anyone who would like to stay on and, and continue talking about today's topic or just to network and meet people. And if there were other announcements, I honestly do not remember them. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it was just what next month's topic was, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. So uh, we'll wait for Brett to announce it. It'll be a fun surprise, everyone. <laughs> All right, um, Charlotte, I think the time is yours. Would you like to uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us a little bit about your background first. Absolutely. Let me uh, try to go to my presentation. Can, give me just one moment. Can you see my presentation yet? Not yet. Okay, give me one more second. How's that? We can yeah. see that now. Yeah, <laughs> I have to admit, um, I copied the title right out of the invite, but uh, before I talk about myself, I want to focus on today's topics, right? We looked like there were some um, subject matters that people were interested in, so I tried to focus on that. So tonight I'd love to talk about resume tips, interview tips, having a strategy to gain more experience, especially in the world of de DevOps, um, how to network successfully, and somebody had put in the invite the perfect job. So no pressure there, right? So perfect, let me um, size this better. Anyhow, my name is Charlotte Westfall. Um, I lived in Utah, my goodness, um, over 30 years. I have about 30 years of professional experience. For the last 22 years, I've been working in tech. My first tech job was in 1999 as an engineering analyst at Hewlett Packard. Worked my way up into roles like VP of product at eBay and worked for larger firms like ADP. After being in the rat race for 20 years, I decided to go into consulting and recruiting. And that's the space that I've primarily focused on in the last 12, excuse me, since 2012. Um, I've worked for other agencies, but just a couple of months ago, I founded my own tech recruiting agency. The name is Ms. Tech Talent. I'll be launching my brand and site next month, but I, I am in business and moving and grooving. And uh, my recruiting specialties are for roles that support the software development life cycle. And then again, another sub layer of uh, diversity and inclusion. So does anyone have any questions before I proceed? Perfect. All right. Some of these tips may seem very basic, but you know, in the least, they're great reminders. I know this seems so basic, but fonts, I read hundreds of resumes every week. And with my old eyes and my old lady glasses, if it's smaller than 10 point or 12 point font, I can't read it, even if I print it. And a lot of people don't realize that those that are reviewing uh, resumes when they're being re reviewed manually might be somebody a lot older than yourself. My generation, right, um, we're used to being able to see things. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Formatting, it seems so basic once again, but making sure that it's clean and crisp, right? Everything lines up. There's a margin, or excuse me, margins are aligned, bullet points are aligned. There's consistent spacing, consistent... Um, use of capitalization and spelling and punctuation, all of those things. And making sure that if you use headers on your resume to make sure they're clear and easy to read. Content, content is a bit tricky because the strategy behind content changes all the time. You could probably Google something tomorrow and they would give you different advice. But really at the end of the day, make sure your most, the most important information is at top 
right? A summary about yourself that's compelling is always nice to have at the top and primary skills. Please, please do not list every skill you have. If you have it on a resume, we are going to expect that you have professional experience, not just exposure, not just um, playing around on your own time, or maybe you've created a project for fun, but we expect if you list it as a primary skill that this is you know, a, a tool or technology or whatnot that you can use on day one. And also make sure that the relevant skills are called out. I think one of the questions might have been, do I need to tweak my res resume for a particular job opening? And the brutal truth is yes. And this is why there's a couple of reasons. So I obviously having my own firm prefer to have human eyes on a resume, but a lot of these bigger companies that you might be applying to are using you know, some kind of automated system or bot and all they're looking for are key buzzwords and key phrases. So something as, sil as uh, simple as developer versus engineer might exclude you from the pool, you might be removed. So just make sure that the key phrases and the key requirements in the, in the job description are reflected in your resume. And again, only if they apply, right? Don't, don't add things that uh, you're not well-versed in. And proofread, I know this seems silly, but proofread it, proofread it again, and then after that, have a second set of eyes on it. Even with today, having written this earlier, I'm sure there are mistakes because I didn't have another set of eyes on it. But more importantly, a lot of companies are looking to see if you're detail-oriented. I have one former client, and I probably shouldn't say their name, but they're in the gaming industry. And if they see one misspelled word, they will not bring you in for an interview. And I wish I was exaggerating, but there are those people that are out there. Perfect. Um, I will, uh, you know, if you have a question, please pipe up. Otherwise, we can do a, a fun little Q&A at the, at the end here. Perfect. Interview tips. So some of these apply to in-person interviews and some of these apply to digital interviews, right? Since most of us are um, working or interviewing from home. The elevator pitch, let's start there. You know, we all hear about elevator pitches for companies, but do you have one prepared for yourself? Because sometimes, you know, someone like myself might start off an interview and say, as I get acclimated, can we start with a short synopsis of your professional career or your professional history? And what I'm listening for is what is compelling? Are you actually describing what you do or want to do in that elevator pitch? And what sets you apart, right? I have to do the same thing for my company, Ms. Tech. But, you know, a year ago when the labor market was not what it was this year. This year is very tight, but last year um, employers had the benefit, right? We, some of the positions I have posted had two, three, 500 applicants. You as a DevOps or engineering professional, you need to be able to quickly stand out as compared to your peers, right? This year, you might not have as much experience, but we all know that the labor market ebbs and flows, whether it's due to the economy or politics or COVID, or whatever it might be. Another reason to have an elevator pitch ready is, you know, somebody once said, it's called an elevator pitch because you might spend approximately 30 seconds on an elevator. What if you have an opportunity to meet somebody or you see somebody famous in the tech world and you happen to be in the same room or on the same elevator? When they ask you what you do, you need to be ready, right? You can't even think about it. You probably have only 30 seconds. So think about that. SAR, the second interview tip, and there are so many, but I'm just going to focus on these for now. That means situation, action, or result. I'm sure every single one of you have been asked, tell me about a situation when, right? Where you were successful or maybe not successful or whatever it might be. You should frame it in a very clear way. I know that my superpower is not articulation. I have to practice these. I have to write these down. I have to get them ready. You need to have situations already predefined. You need to talk about the actions that you took and what the results were. And it seems silly, but just like a speech, 
you know, if you can have three to five situations memorized as it relates to the job you might be seeking, you'll definitely stand out. Uh, another thing it seems again so basic, but have questions ready, meaningful questions, approximately five or so. Most interviewers, myself or my clients, usually leave 15 minutes or so for Q&A at the end of an hour call. One thing that's really disappointing for my clients, if they say, what questions do you have for me? And the candidate says, I don't have any questions. It, it looks, whether it's the case or not, it looks like you're ill-prepared or possibly not very interested in the opportunity. And make sure, again, they're meaningful and intelligent. If you can craft some questions that pull directly from their objectives or their core values or why they've been in the media recently, whatever it may be, just make sure it's thoughtful. And then study up. <laughs> One of my favorite questions is, depending on which client I'm interviewing for um, on their behalf, is one of my clients is called a credible. And I will often ask, so why are you interested in a credible? What do we do that interests you? If you cannot tell me what that company does, you're obviously again, ill-prepared or maybe not that interested, right? Um, there's nothing more disheartening for someone who's conducting the interviews like myself than to realize after 40 minutes of, of your valuable time that you don't even know who you're interviewing for. Um, and so hence everything you've said before that is, is not as meaningful. And then ending on the easiest of all notes is the basics. I can tell you that the number one frustration for me and um, for my clients is please, please, please be on time. It's probably been the biggest challenge since interviews, since the beginning of interviews, right? Whether you're online or in person, being on time means being early. If you are going to arrive in person, try to be 10 to 15 minutes early. It's okay if you check in early and uh, it's okay if you wait in the lobby and, and you know, practice your your pitch or your SARS, you know, that's fine. Um, in fact, some of my clients, I hate to say this, especially if you're in a fishbowl, but if you're sitting in the lobby, sometimes they'll even watch what you're doing. Like, are you preparing? Are you friendly to people? What are you doing with your time? Just sometimes they're observing from afar and, and that's a little freaky, I realize, but you know, you're there to um, be observed one way or another. Now, if you have an online interview, I know you're all technologists and this might be a little bit redundant, but please make sure that whatever application the client is using, whether it's Zoom, Teams, um, WebEx, some random or obscure service, you know, load it in advance. We sometimes know that if you need to download something, maybe it is not accessible via the web, it can take 5, 10, 15 minutes, right? And test it, test it the night before. Test your monitor, test your speaker, log in, set up a fake meeting with a friend if you need to, just be prepared. Um, I don't know if people realize, but somebody like myself, I can have 25 or 30 interviews on in one day on a busy day. And I'm usually going back to back to back. And sometimes they're 50 minute screens, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. But if you show up late, you know, it doesn't mean that I can go over on time. In fact, you know, I try to be a timekeeper and be respectful and say, look, thank you. I know we didn't get through everything today, but I have another interview to start right after this. So, you know, we'll have to continue this later, but being on time is so simple, but, you know, we all know that's the right thing. And dress appropriately, whether you're going in person or online. And I, you know, it's the same advice I give college or high school graduates, dress appropriately. Just because you're working from home, you know, don't be in your pajamas or um, I know this is a little bit funny, but I don't know if you guys have seen this online, but there's a guy that was interviewing and he didn't have pants on, just underpants and a t-shirt. And he stood up in the middle of the interview. Yeah, that, that video has probably been seen about 3 million times. Don't be that person. And even if the culture of the company is casual, you know, you've got a lot of these um, tech companies, especially here in Utah, where, you know, they like to wear hoodies and baseball hats. Don't be that person on the day of the interview. Sure, once you start, but, you know, dress to impress. It's just a sign of respect at the end of the day.
and stay focused. Um, I realize not everyone here is of the same generation. I'm a bit older and cell phones and gosh, pagers didn't even exist when I started interviewing myself. But I have literally been in interviews myself or with clients where people pull out their phones and start texting. Um, and if you're at home, you know, you have children or dogs like I do running around, they'll probably interrupt actually. Make sure the door is shut, that it's locked so you can remain focused. I don't know about you, but when my dogs start barking or my spouse interrupts me, I, I lose my train of thought. And, uh, you know, it's just, again, a sign of respect. And one thing I think that's been lost, it's kind of a lost art, is thanking the interview. I don't mean thanking me or a client at the end of the discussion. It means actually a written thank you. And it can be digital. I highly doubt anyone um, mails thank yous anymore. Sometimes I see them being dropped off, but thank the interviewer for their time. And it also gives you an opportunity to quickly summarize what you think you are the best option for this company, right? It's a great time also to even extract, extract some of the, excuse me, extract some of the key points from your, from your elevator pitch, right? Um, gosh, I'd say less than 5% of the time I get a thank you, less than 5%. And my generation, that was just something you did. And even though it might be old school, you gotta remember a lot of people that are conducting the interviews are going to be Gen X. So we might be old, but we still uh, believe in the, in the basics around being polite. All right, um, at the end here, we can talk about more interview tips if you like. Strategy when you don't have a lot of experience. I believe this was a hot topic. I was trying to get some background information. It's very, very difficult to place somebody that doesn't have professional experience. And for those of you that may not have any yet or, or have two years or less, I feel for you, I really do. But there are some things that you can do to at least give yourself a little bit more of an advantage. And the first thing that I would recommend is market yourself. I think most of you are DevOps or engineers, right? Build a site about you that you can direct people to and use that as an opportunity to demonstrate your development skills, right? Even if you're in DevOps, right? You, you know at least one programming language. You might know Python or Java or JavaScript or whatever it might be, but build an online portfolio about you. Um, or build something. I know a lot of you that are a little bit younger than me might have been coding or whatnot since you were a tiny child. Have something, even if you don't have professional experience, if you've built a game or a web app or you have an app in, in one of the app stores, that is really cool. If you live with me today could say, hey, yeah, I've actually got something I can show you. Let's open it up right now. Here's a game that does this. That will wow me, right? or a plugin, um, same, same kind of concept. Um, the third tip I would say for those that have less experience than others is to participate. Um, the most obvious example is today. Um, I'm not sure how many people are online right now, but I think your DevOps community has quite a large um, user base, right? Um, you can participate in Reddit chats um, and you can, you know, it, it could be as silly as, I'm trying to think of a group. There's a group I follow called Hike the Wasatch. May not have a lot of technologists, but if you find out that someone you're trying to connect with or network with is part of that group and they go on these weekly hikes and you can get, you can get one or two hours of their undivided time, that's good. Another thing, um, was there a question? Okay, perfect. Another thing is don't be afraid to toot your own horn, right? We're all kind of socialized to not brag, but this is your opportunity to brag. And how do you do that? Through your projects and, and your coding, right? So if you don't have a central repository that's publicly available like GitHub, get one. And when you do set it up, make sure you have an embeddable link on your resume, make it easy for someone like me to click on it and go see your work or make it easy for one of my clients to go into your GitHub and, and look at your code. And of course, we all realize that not all code can be shared with the public, you know, due to IP or whatnot, but that which is 
is relevant, get it up there. Um, you know, you might be junior in your field, but if you can demonstrate clearly your skills, that will help you. And tests, that's the fifth point, excuse me. This might sound weird, and I've never actually seen this on any kind of website or advice, um, you know, a blog that gives advice, tests. So we all know companies like Pluralsight, Udemy, whatnot, and you can do self-evaluations. Most of those companies have free accounts and you can go in and do an assessment. Well, one of the ones that I often recommend is Pluralsight, not just because they're a Utah company, but because they their assessments, it takes about five minutes to set up your account and maybe five to 10 minutes to take a specific assessment. Um, let's say that you just got out of school or just got out of boot camp or even just right out of high school and you don't have any professional experience, but you know you're, you're intermediate or advanced with your skills. How, how do you prove that? Well, let me give you, if you don't mind, an example. So I uh, volunteer with Code to Success and one of their partners is, is um, Deb Mountain. And then I forgot the other, all of a sudden I forgot the other school they work with besides Newmont, um, Bottega. And, you know, Bottega's class had, I don't know, 300 and something graduates in their, in their cohort at the time. And I said, I'd love to see the resume of the person who tested the best or the person that you would consider your, your valedictorian per se. And they send me a resume. And I, I of course don't wanna say his name, but nice young man, just graduated high school, most likely 18 years old, had taken four years of computer science in high school. Some of them, um, you know, AP type classes. He'd been coding since he was five years old. He'd won competitions, all of these things. But for the life of me, I couldn't get him a development job. Like, you know, even the clients that I've been working with for years and years say, you know, that's, it's too bad. We just don't have any openings. This, this was last year, to be clear, during the, the first round of COVID. Um, but you can have them apply for one of our internships. I don't know if you guys know what the internship space looks like. But at um, a former client was Vivint. They usually get about a thousand applicants a quarter and they choose one person, one. Um, similar thing for Podium. So I delved into my personal network and I thought, okay, who can relate to this young man that maybe you know doesn't have a lot of experience? And I dug into my Newmont network and remembered that the director of development was one of my former mentees. And so I knew I could get his ear. What I had this young man do is take five or six assessments in Pluralsight and embed the results into his resume. So it made it really easy for my friend at Podium to click and see that even though this young man had never had an internship or any professional experience, he was testing at the very top. Um, Pluralsight, if you haven't used it before, they have a score from zero to 300. And, you know, they show how you test against your peers. And, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people that have taken the same test. This young man was in the top 1%. And that's how we got him in the door. He was able to get a paid internship at Podium. And the only reason I was able to build a business case is because he took those assessments, right? We were getting creative and, and whatnot. You know, I built a beautiful narrative about him, but how in the heck could I demonstrate that he really was that good? So just, you know, get creative, um, start building your portfolio. Think about it just like for those of you that went to college, right? We all know what it was like applying for college. You have to talk about all your extracurricular activities and your awards and what you've done. There's no difference with, with applying for your, for your next job. So think about some of those ways to garner experience. And I didn't want to put this in the deck because this is probably not the most awesome option, but you know, if you're convinced that DevOps is your career path and that's where you want to be, and if you're having issue, you know, landing a position, you might want to take something that's a little lesser or something that's considered a step to DevOps. It's not uncommon to see people be uh, working at a help desk or an IT technician or a sysadmin or, or whatnot, right? Um, 
you know, you might have to take an alternative pathway. You might not go straight into DevOps or a software engineering role, and that's okay. Uh, if you, when I, <laughs> I'm working on several DevOps roles right now, just like Katrina is, and um, I don't think I've seen anybody's career path where they just jumped right into DevOps, and and we don't expect you to be. Awesome, um, successful networking. So. Networking is so strange right now during COVID, and um, we're all grateful for things like Meetup, right? We all know that face-to-face -face is the best way to do it, um, but be safe during COVID, right? But when you do have a face-to-face -face opportunity, it's absolutely the best way to showcase yourself. Someone like me might not just be listening to what you say. We're looking at your body language, your expressions, your pitch, your tone, um, how you hold yourself, um, how you interact with others. If you listen, all of those things, you know, it's the best way to, to really gauge somebody. Um, long gone are the days of doing this, but I remember in the 90s and, and shortly thereafter, it was very common to go to dinner after your final interview. And most people didn't realize that was the real interview. They want to see what you're like when you think you're, um, off the clock or you're outside of that interview, right? But a lot of people wanna see face-to-face -face what you're like as a human being. So take advantage of those opportunities when you can. Uh, another way to network is offering to help. I know um, some of you are co coordinating this meetup, right? Every one of you knows that you've made some valuable relationships here. Um, you know, volunteer, offer to help, offer to connect people. Um, even before I went into recruiting, right, I just knew it was the right thing to do to connect person A to uh, person B. In fact, um, my link to this group is Katrina. And uh, Katrina was actually a former client of mine. Uh, we liked each other with work. We, you know, stayed in touch. I wanted to connect her to some successful women in tech. We started at attending these monthly events before COVID. And I wasn't necessarily gaining anything out of it. Um, the relationship was the most important thing. Her friendship was the most important thing. And, you know, if, if some kind of business, continued business relationship um, came out of it, that was okay. And that kind of goes into relationships. Um, the third point is don't go immediately into selling yourself if you're hiking with somebody or at church or at a birthday party build the relationship first find something you can you can relate to with each other it doesn't have to be technology or work it could be dogs it could be coffee it could be maybe you play the same online game whatever it is build that relationship first if you go in and, and immediately try to sell yourself right i mean just to be very blunt that's very off-putting um it's different than asking for help right get to know somebody and then follow up and say, hey, it was nice to meet you. I see that you have a really deep network. I see you're connected to person A at Vivint. Do you mind introducing me? That's a much better approach. Don't be too forceful. Um, the next thing about networking is making sure that you leverage social networks. You're all tech savvy, much more than myself. You know, leverage Reddit, leverage Indeed, or Glassdoor, or LinkedIn, or Facebook, or wherever you spend your time. Um, you know, I know some of you, I think somebody posted their Twitter handle at the beginning, and that's fantastic. Um, you know, even if you don't know somebody, right, you join a group where you have common interests or, or common goals, and it's a great way to organically, excuse me, advertise yourself. And you know, amongst the social networks and online resources, don't be afraid to say, I'm open to work. Even though the economy is quite strong right now and it is in the candidate's favor right now. Um, I have clients that get like zero applicants right now because <laughs> there's so much competition. Um, don't be afraid to say you're open to work. Um, I have a few candidates. I, I don't know if any of you heard, but Zant was acquired and almost everybody was laid off last week. You know, that's not your fault if you work for Zant. Um, change your frame on LinkedIn and Facebook right away and post something on your wall. Say, hey, I'm open to work. This is what I'm looking for. If you have any ideas, come my way. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And better yet, if you've got somebody very influential in one of the circles that maybe you're trying to break into, have them post it for you. I have a client at Master Control and he's the CIO. And when he has a friend in his network or an associate that's looking, he'll post it on his wall and say, look, um, I know this person, you know, I've worked with them or they're my neighbor or whatever. Maybe it's even a relative. Is anyone looking for this, you know, senior DevOps engineer? That's great. Don't be afraid to ask people to help. Um, and networks, creating your own networks. Obviously, one of you started this meetup, right? And there's thousands of meetups. Um, and tech can be kind of interesting in Utah. I love Utah. I live here. But when I worked at eBay, and that was only 14 years ago when I started, I remember my first day and I looked around the room, a group of 58 people, I counted them. I'm, I'm, I'm weird that way. I was the only female in the room. And this was an engineering team. I was the only female, period. Um, and do you know what I did with that? Actually built um, a network that's kind of well known now. Um, and it actually spawned out of uh, Salt Lake City, okay. eBay Women in Technology. It's a, a group of thousands of users now. Um, it's not just internal to eBay. They invite all professional women or people who identify as women to join. And I also use that as um, the basis for my thesis. So why women have difficulty creating networks and um, you get the idea. Don't be afraid to you know, build your own networks. Um, another thing that I was toying with, and I think Katrina heard about this, but life took over is um, at the beginning of COVID, um, she and I were no longer able to go to these, these monthly meetups, or I shouldn't say meetups, these monthly lunches with other professional women. I was thinking, you know what, what do we do instead? Maybe we can set up a professional book group and we talk about different concepts each month, right? Don't be afraid to create your own network. And, and, you know, obviously it makes more sense than not if it has something to do with the field that you're, you're in or trying to enter. And, you know, if you're kind of scared of starting one on your own, ask someone to do it with you. It's a lot more fun when you, when you have a buddy. Awesome. This is my favorite slide. <laughs> one of you mentioned, how do you find the perfect job? <laughs> I, I really thought about this um, over the last two weeks and today there is no perfect job. If you're younger and you think, um, you know, maybe you have less experience, that the grass is greener, it may not be. Every job has its pros and cons about the role you're going into. Every company has um, quirks with their culture. The best thing you can do is talk to people you trust. Talk to people that work at that company. Even if you don't know them, get an introduction. And, you know, hopefully during your, your interview processes, um, part of the organic conversation, if, if I were interviewing you, the first thing, and there goes my dog, interruptions. Um, <laughs> please forgive me. Um, and now I'm, I'm off script, but um, one of my favorite questions is, you know, candidate X, culture is very important. What kind of culture do you need to thrive, right? Think about that and read the online reviews. Look at Glassdoor, look at those anonymous sites. Very, very valuable. Um, one of my clients has a perfect five-star rating and guess what? You better believe I use that as part of my pitch when I'm trying to att attract candidates, right? So the perfect job is so subjective. It's, I'm sure if we surveyed each one of you online here, even though you're all in a similar field, that definition would vary. So just think about what's the perfect job for you. What's most important? Is it culture? Is it compensation? Is it location? Is it job growth? Right. Um, and then start to, you know, distill your search from there. And I'm sorry that I don't have a, a way to say to find the perfect job. I just personally, from my humble lens, I don't believe it exists. <laughs> I know I'm almost over time. So I just wanted to end with a few statistics, if you don't mind. DevOps today, when I say today, and I underlined it, I mean, as in like two hours ago, I wanted this to be relevant. We all know that um, technology moves faster than we do. 
So per LinkedIn, which is um, the most popular site, right, for connecting, um, there are 855 open DevOps roles today. And I bet some of those are mine and Katrina's. 855. Do you know what it looked like last year? Two. Literally two. So this is a great time to look. This is, again, your time to shine. So I looked at how many open DevOps roles there were in the US, 88,000. <laughs> That's just amazing. And, you know, 15% of those or 20% of those are remote. 16,000 jobs are remote. So we're also <laughs> that trend now about remote opportunities, right? And if you're very skilled at DevOps and you can stand on your own two feet, there's no reason you cannot make a business case for, for working remote, either fully or part-time. Um, Another thing too is while you're doing searches or if you're trying to align with specific jobs, remember not everybody uses the DevOps terminology. They might have it listed as a systems engineer or a site reliability engineer, or IT engineer. There's so many variations. So, so when I put these numbers up in bullet form, I just use DevOps, right? And some of the tools out there will give you similar titles and, and let you continue to do a deeper dive into your search. But just remember, there, you know, this is a relatively new, relatively new field, and, and many people call it many things. Um, the next bullet point talks about beyond programming languages. You know, we talked about Python and Java and JavaScript that are pretty standard for DevOps. The most popular tools and technologies that are being asked for right now are Jenkins, Git, AW, you know, and then of course, whatever uh, cloud service you're using, Docker, Kibana, and, and MySQL. If for some reason you don't have these and you've got extra time on your hands with COVID, I would highly suggest you start working on these because these are becoming the de facto or the current de facto, right? We could talk about this next year and my list would probably be different. Um, Internships, for those of you that are, are new to this field, um, internships in Utah typically pay 15 to 25 an hour. That may not seem like a lot, but if that's a starting point for you and a way to break into this field, you know, plan for that and, uh, you know, plan on working your way up. Um, Full-time in Utah, the range is very wide. It's it's 50,000 on the low end, kind of starting, you know, right at that, that high end of the internship up to approximately 150,000. And the average today in Utah is 104,000. So, you know, there are a lot of online assessments where you can go um, find out your worth. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to use that when you're negotiating, lean in. And if you're not sure what you're worth, talk to people, talk to the people in this group, right? We can help advise you. And I wanted to quickly compare that to national. So full-time employees, the range is wider in the US. Um, well, just a tiny bit wider, 60,000 to 165, but the average is 99. Um, what that obviously points out is Utah used to pay less than market rate. Well, guess what? In the last couple of years, that's changed. A lot of people in Utah are now considered expensive. Um, our pay rates are, are coming in above um, average market rates across the nation. And I know I've gone over time, so thank you. I'm sorry, I know I was supposed to end at 640, but um, I've shared this presentation with Katrina, which if you want to network, if you want some help, if you want help finding a job, or if you simply just want some advice or a second set of eyes on your resume, I'm more than happy to help because at the end of the day, um, I believe in karma and to, uh, you know, I hopefully Katrina can <laughs> vouch for me that that um, you know I'm authentically and and genuinely here to help you however I can and again I'm very grateful for being invited and humbled that you actually listened the whole time so Katrina I don't know if people want to ask questions or just have we actually happen. do have a couple questions right? and I'm not looking at the chat I'm sorry but when I get distracted can someone tell me what the first question is um, the first question was, what type of thing can make an elevator pitch set you apart? Mm -hmm. Is it things like specific projects you worked on, or do you have any other suggestions or examples? To find what your unique value, your personal unique value prop is. How are you better and different? And sometimes people talk about that as self-branding. When I was still working in the corporate world, 
and I still probably have this on my LinkedIn, I'm probably embarrassed to say that, um, after going through a workshop at, at EWIT, eBay Women in Technology, I created a brand for myself and I was in program and product management at the time and I came up with Delivery Diva and guess what? That sticks in people's head. Find your unique value and figure out how to brand it and embed it that way. Next. Awesome. Um, I think somebody had their hand raised. Sorry, I'm going to let you um, facilitate. No, you're yeah. fine. Take a drink. Talking is hard work. Um, did somebody else have a question and I missed their hand raise? And hopefully this wasn't too redundant. And, um, you know, I'd like to stay with, you know, the last few minutes at the, the social hour and the, the, those last few minutes and, and get to know you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Charlotte. We appreciate it. I am double checking, making sure we're not skipping over anybody. <laughs> I know there's a lot of things in the chat and I apologize, but we all know how awkward it is to present. <laughs> all right. Um, well, we do have this recorded. I had somebody ask if we are going to be distributing this out. We can distribute this. Um, I've also got Charlotte's presentation, so we can distribute just that as well. Um, if you'd like it specifically, please feel free to contact myself. Um, it's, I just forgot what my email is. Maria, do you know what my email is? <laughs> it's kbrinkley at slcdevopsdays.org. Um, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll throw it in the chat here as well. Um, or you can reach out to Charlotte directly too. We're not going to handicap you at all there. Oh, I had one last comment. And I know there are many folks on here um, that I know are seeking DevOps gurus. If by chance you're looking, and yes, this is a tiny plug, I do have some open positions, but no pressure. If you reach out, great. If you don't, we'll meet again. That is actually the last few minutes is networking and letting people have conversations about where they're hiring or uh, what they're hiring for. So great. Thank you for kicking us off, Charlotte. Um, <laughs> Personally, I have a couple of DevOps positions myself for AWS uh, open and available. Um, anybody else out there who has positions they're either looking for or looking to fill? Feel free to unmute yourselves and start chatting away. So I had a question, um, either Charlotte or Katrina. How much and how valuable do you think certifications are? For example, like AWS certifications. May I, can we both answer that, Katrina? Let me try to answer that with data, right? Since most of you are probably data-driven. I'd say 50% of the DevOps roles I've worked on in last year require certifications. And yes, I know there are many flavors. And yes, I do think they're valuable. Go ahead, Katrina. Uh, for me, it is when I'm looking at candidates to hire, I am looking for experience or certifications. Um, so for me, the certifications kind of fill a gap. Um, if I see that maybe you don't have the experience, but you've gone out and gotten your own certifications, that will get you through the door, um, that, that drive for certifications. But if you have the experience, it's not as important. It's seen more for me as a bonus. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? We can end a little bit early. Otherwise, I don't know any good jokes. Sorry. <laughs> I'm terrible at telling jokes. It's it's not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> you think we have time for a couple uh, introductions? Uh, I know some some meetups will do yeah. that, especially when there's this few. Uh, people. Sure, Todd, if you'd like to do that, we can see who'd like to put themselves out there and do some introductions. Excellent. I'm guessing you want to start? Well, just briefly why I'm here, I guess. Uh, I'm good friends with uh, with Brett Palmer, and he tries to recruit me into DevOps. I'm a senior developer and uh, dab a little bit with it, but uh, just I, I've learned a lot. I, I, I'm uh, halfway looking for uh, something as a senior developer. Um, and I've, and I've learned quite a bit, you know, uh, from the presentation that applies to that. So I appreciate that. 
Um, but yeah, I, uh, I also run Ionic Utah Meetup, which has been on hiatus. We've been inactive for a year <laughs> through the pandemic, but uh, looking to get started again soon. And Brett is a co-host of that as well. And uh, so that, that's kind of what I'm doing. And uh, anyways, yeah, it's great to be here and good, good to connect with you too. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Welcome. Um, I guess I could introduce myself since I just started hosting the meeting and not many people know me. Um, my name is Katrina Brinkley. I work for the Utah State Board of Education as the Chief Product Owner and Program Manager. Um, I have been working in IT for way too long, um, over 15 years now. And I, sorry, I just got distracted by chat. Um, I okay. am, as mentioned, uh, looking for a couple of DevOps roles. I actually have a couple of senior uh, developer roles as well, um, and some automation engineers that are coming up, and some, what else do I have? A data engineer and a product owner position um, <laughs> open. We're hiring like crazy here. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. I and we have also never... have operations roles open. Yes, we do. We have some help desk and some some straight operations roles, um, DBAs and stuff like that open. Same. Um, <laughs> so much. <laughs> Mark, yeah. I have never heard of KubeCon before. Can you can you share what that is? Just to uh, mention for uh, Kubernetes, um, I went there in 2019. <laughs> it was my introduction to it. So now I'm going back. Awesome. I didn't know that they had their own con. I'd never heard of it before. That's awesome. I'll throw a link up here. Thank you for sharing. I have a quick question. Is this specific to Utah or do we have national members as part of this meetup? I think the majority of our members are from Salt Lake. Though, Maria, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have had some interest from Colorado and Arizonians. <laughs> we, we have had quite a few people RSVP from, from within the Intermountain West. I think the furthest we've ever had a reservation from was someone in India who tells, tells me they're getting up really early in the morning <laughs> to attend. And um, the farthest in the States we've had is Texas. Awesome. Thank you for the data, Maria. Anybody else want to take a minute, introduce themselves? Well, since I was talking after you, my name is Maria Bates. Um, I guess I could turn my camera on, but I guess I'm not going to. Um, I'm a scrum master. I'm a recovering product owner. I'm working with Katrina at uh, the Utah School Board of Education in order to help change the culture to be a little more agile and a little less government. Cross our fingers. <laughs> and yay for diversity. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome, and Xavier, that's awesome from New Orleans. Yeah. So uh, New Orleans is further than Austin, so Xavier <laughs> wins. wins. You're Win officially the winner. <laughs> <laughs> you win a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? Feel free to jump in. Todd, did I see you unmute for a second? I'm gonna call on you. I'm just going to start calling names. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> no? All right. Cool. We will wrap this up then and get the recording out. Um, it may be a little while while Maria and I figure out how to do Brett's job. Um, oh, nice to see you. I'm going to mispronounce your name if I try. So thank you for joining us from Virginia. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody. We'll get this sent, information sent out. Um, and please let us know if you have any further questions. Also, if you have any topics that you'd like to, us to cover in the next few months for this meetup, we are open for suggestions. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.
And thank you, Charlotte, for taking the time to present. It was great. Thank you. I'm humbled. Thank you.